Welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. My name's Tom, and I'm your host. Thanks for joining me this evening. In his 1933 inaugural address, United States President Franklin D. Roosevelt famously said, The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. In tonight's deliciously autumnal fairy tale, we'll travel along with a plucky young man named Hans to find out if this is really true. There are many different versions of this classic tale, which has been known as The Boy Who Knew No Fear, among other titles. Although ours will fit the Halloween mood with some seasonal October shivers, this story is meant to inspire more amusement and pleasant sleepiness than scares, and we hope you enjoy it. It's a very long episode tonight, the longest single story I've ever recorded on the show in fact, so you'll have lots of time to drop off to sleep while you listen. And if you miss anything, you can always come back and pick up wherever you left off. A big thanks to Alicia Stefan for writing this story. Let's take a moment to be mindful and to bring ourselves into the here and now. Take a nice deep breath. Breathing in through the nose and out through the nose or mouth. And as you breathe slowly and smoothly, scan your awareness over your whole body, starting from the top of your head and working down. As you pay attention to your body, just note how each area feels. It might be relaxed and tired, or perhaps a little tense and restless. You may notice aches or discomfort in some places. But without judgment, just notice these sensations and reassure yourself that now is the time to rest. Gradually scan all the way down through your legs and into the feet as well. And in your own time, take a few more deep breaths before letting it return to its natural rhythm. Now, imagine a cozy village nestled deep in the forest. There are only a couple of roads in and one or two roads out. And one of those paths is about to bring us a mysterious traveler and a grand adventure. This is where our story begins. There was once a young man named Hans 
who never appeared to be afraid of anything. It was understandable that he had not yet reached an age when he had the wisdom to worry about life's little problems. However, the lack of fear he showed for absolutely any situation seemed to verge on foolishness. That little shiver that a normal person would experience, the nerves that make someone pause before doing something new, or the feeling of alertness one would have from hearing a strange noise. These were experiences Hans had never had. From an early age, no tree was too tall to climb, and no stream too wide to cross. Hans simply plunged bravely into the fray. Because he also appeared to be a very lucky person, he always escaped unscathed. This made him disregard the advice of his elders, that he should be more careful. Indeed, Hans seemed to live a charmed life. All the village girls thought he was awfully handsome. His generous nature and quick smile won him many friends. He was good at making jokes as well. Any local gathering was more amusing with Hans there. He was light on his feet, good with a story, and entirely likable. The fact that he was also willing to take on just about any madcap adventure or wild plan only enhanced his charms. There were things about him that his family found less charming, however. His parents had another son, his older brother Klaus. He and Klaus were as different as night and day. The elder brother was not a very humorous person. In fact, he tended toward being a bit dull. However, he was extremely responsible and was a great help to their parents in the family business. Hans, on the other hand, had no serious plans to follow in his parents' footsteps. He had big dreams that made him yearn for a life beyond his humble village. Although he would obediently sit down to complete tasks his parents set for him, he would usually be found thumbing through a favorite book or staring into space a short time later. His parents were concerned that without a useful trade and a reputation for reliability, he would not be successful in life. But as usual, Hans was afraid of nothing. That included experiencing any bad future effects from his unruly ways. When his mother implored him to apply himself more, he patted her kindly on the shoulder and told her not to worry. Hans assured her he would be ready to face any problems that came his way. He was absolutely not afraid. It just so happened 
that one windy autumn, a stranger passed through town. He was a mysterious looking older man who traveled with a bundle of books, pen, and paper. The visitor got a room at the local inn, for there was only one tavern in the small hamlet. Of course, half the town showed up in the pub that night, hoping he would come down from his room for supper. A visitor was a somewhat rare occurrence. To get a look at him would be exciting, but the idea that he brought news was even more enticing. Small villages tended to be somewhat isolated in those times. The assembled company were not disappointed, as the man did eventually emerge from his room. He was quite amiable as it turned out. He sat himself down at one of the rough wooden tables, ordered some stew and a tankard of ale, and was quickly drawn into conversation by some eager local boys. Hans was of course among them. Klaus was there too, but he hung back in the shadows, listening. The stranger was a scribe and a storyteller, it turned out. This made him the most popular type of guest. As the wild October evening rattled the shutters of the pub, the man began to spin tales of far-off places. Too soon, The night grew late, and the number of people in the pub began to dwindle. The stranger, however, announced that he would tell one last story. He said it would be a ghost story, and that anyone with tender sensibilities should go home to their bed. The remaining folk laughed jovially. Not a single one of them would admit to being scared of a tale spun by firelight at the pub. Ten minutes later, nearly the entire company in the little tavern were shaking in their boots. The stranger was indeed a master storyteller. He built up a dark story of suspense and thrilled every listener with its spine-tingling conclusion. Well, every listener that is, except Hans. At the end of the story, he chided the others, saying he couldn't believe they were scared. Smiling broadly, he shrugged and said he was not afraid at all. The scribe puffed slowly on his pipe and regarded Hans with a searching gaze. After a few moments, he said, Young man, if you are truly this impervious to fear, I may know of a way that you can achieve greatness. At this, Klaus rolled his eyes, but Hans sat up straight and eager, 
and urged the man to continue. A couple of days' journey from here, straight through the forest, you will come upon a grand castle, the man said. There is a king who lives there with his only child. She is a maiden of unsurpassed beauty, but her father has impossibly high standards for any man who would seek to marry her. At this, the other boys in the pub laughed, patting hands on the back. The idea that a simple village boy would somehow meet such high standards, did seem ridiculous. Hans asked the man why he would even qualify as a suitor in that case. The man held up his finger, clearly ready to deliver the key piece of information. Then he continued. The castle is beautiful, but it's also rumored to be haunted. Other hopeful visitors have been known to hear and see things so strange that they depart in haste the very next day. Some, in fact, don't even wait until morning. The king is seeking a man who is brave enough to last three entire nights in this enchanted place. He must truly be a person who knows no fear. At this, the remaining company fell silent and thoughtful. Hans and his talent for boldness were famous in the village. In fact, his lack of fear was his defining quality. Perhaps a simple country boy would have a chance if this were the test. As the assembled villagers finally disbanded and wandered home to their warm beds, Hans asked the scribe to draw him a map. The grizzled traveler did just that, indicating to Hans where he would find important landmarks and where he must go in order to make his way to the haunted castle. First, according to the man, he must cross a narrow, swinging bridge over a chasm. The visitor cautioned that this was a task that scared some people, but he assumed Hans would have no concerns. Then, he would eventually find a cave. He must enter the cave and walk through it. Although it was not apparent from the opening, it was a tunnel to a path on the other side. The scribe suggested bringing a torch for this part of the journey as the tunnel would be completely dark. Lastly, Hans would come upon a massive dead oak tree. If he could find the courage to reach inside, he would discover a handbell. This bell would summon someone to open the castle gates for him. Without ringing the bell, he would not be admitted. Hans listened carefully to all of these important instructions, 
for he was a very bright boy, even if he rarely exerted himself. The truth was, he had always been looking for challenges that would truly interest him. This quest appeared to be the test he had always envisioned for himself. Thanking the kind storyteller, he took the map and carefully rolled it up into his coat. As he exited through the door of the pub, he got a final glimpse of the old traveller puffing away on his pipe by the fire, and saw that the man was smiling to himself. The next day, despite his parents' objections, Hans could be seen trudging through the village with a knapsack of belongings over his back. As he made his way to the forest path, he waved cheerfully to his friends and neighbors, who appeared at their windows, stood in their doorways, and stopped to look at him on their way to the market. Klaus likewise watched his brother with skepticism as he disappeared into the distance. He had no interest in going on such a wild goose chase as this, he thought. Folding his arms in ill humor, he began his chores for the day. Hans looked over his shoulder at the edge of the village and could just barely see his mother waving at him from their front stoop. Then, turning to face the unknown, he began his journey. It was one of those really fine sunny autumn days. Hans felt his spirits lift as he breathed deeply of the crisp October air. His feet made a pleasing swishing and crunching noise as he journeyed through the part of the forest he was familiar with. After all, he had been exploring these woods since he was a child and there were areas around the village he knew quite well. The trees were ablaze with fiery colors. Every few steps he saw an orange leaf, or a red leaf, or a yellow leaf, as it spun lazily through the air and came to its resting place on the forest floor. He was surrounded by the familiar and comforting earthy smells of the season. By the time the sun was shining at its lowest angle in the sky, he was encountering unfamiliar territory. The path through the woods was still visible. He had just never walked this far before. He was beginning to get tired after traveling such a long way, and noticed he was dragging his feet more than before. The swish of his own footsteps lulled him into a rhythm. Just a little farther, he kept thinking, and then I'll stop for the night. Right when he felt he couldn't go any further, 
he came upon the swinging bridge the scribe had spoken of. Looking at it, he could see why some people shied away from using it. The chasm that it crossed was rather wide, and the bridge looked as if it had been there for quite some time. Hans, however, was unaffected by these observations. Eager to cross the gap and settle for the night, he grabbed both sides of the narrow bridge and confidently stepped forward. He advanced steadily from one plank to the next, undisturbed even when a bird flew beneath him. With consistent progress and good balance, he was soon on the other side. He looked back at the bridge and nodded to himself with satisfaction. Well, he thought, that wasn't bad at all. With his victory over the swinging bridge behind him, he took off his knapsack. It felt so much heavier than it had this morning. Then he collected a bit of firewood and built himself a cheerful blaze in a clearing off to the side of the forest path. After enjoying a dinner of bread and cheese, he rolled himself up in his wool blanket and fell into a deep sleep almost instantly. After all, there really wasn't anything in these woods he was afraid of. The next morning, Hans awoke to a coating of frost and brilliant rays of sun reaching through the trees. He unrolled himself from his blanket and rubbed his hands together vigorously, blowing into them to warm his fingers and his nose. His first night in the forest had passed without incident, and he was anxious to be on his way again. Without bothering to light a fire, he simply packed up and went on his way, eating some leftover bread as he walked. He was so confident that there was nothing lying ahead that he couldn't handle. Hans trekked all morning without encountering a single person, although he certainly saw many a squirrel or bird along his way. The whole forest seemed engaged in the important task of preparing for winter. As if to make that point, the temperatures slowly dropped throughout the day, and the once sunny skies became cloudy and grey. Hans wrapped his blanket around himself as he walked, and the lad began to think fondly of an evening campfire but he had not yet reached the tunnel the storyteller had spoken of, and he knew it would be best to get through it before stopping for the night. The skies were too overcast for him to see a sunset, but he sensed twilight was approaching. 
Luckily, just when he was beginning to think he might not get there, he finally reached the mouth of the tunnel. He'd made it just in time to pass through before the day's end. As he fumbled in his backpack for the torch he had brought, he heard a light whining noise. Looking off to the side, he saw a little brown dog sitting by the mouth of the cave. He couldn't imagine how a dog had ventured way out here all by itself, but the creature was certainly excited to see him. Wagging its tail energetically, it slowly walked in his direction, clearly hoping for a friend. Hans had a soft spot for animals. He leaned down to pet the dog, and it wiggled its hindquarters with delight. Hans thought to himself that he would simply let the dog come with him. But there was a problem. The torch Hans had brought would not light. Although he tried and tried, he was unsuccessful. Peering into the mouth of the tunnel, he shrugged to himself. He would just go through it in the dark. As if sensing his thoughts, the little dog trotted confidently forward and then turned to him with a cheerful bark. They would head into the unknown together. Another person might have had some concerns about stepping into that inky blackness, but Hans was unaffected by worry. As he and the dog moved forward, the waning daylight behind them was quickly extinguished. Meanwhile, they were proceeding on faith. If the scribe hadn't told him there was an exit ahead, he would have assumed he was descending into the belly of the earth. The air temperature around them dropped and felt clammy as they slowly put one foot in front of the other. Hans did begin to wish for the friendly guidance of the torch, if only so he could walk without bumping into a stone wall. Reaching out with his hands, he could feel the dripping rocks to his right and left. The passage was not wide. If he ever thought of losing his footing, however, the friendly little dog was there for him. Walking just in front of Hans, but close by, his trusty new companion didn't allow him to make a mistake. Together, the two persisted until they saw a weak light streaming towards them. Then, all at once, the trial was passed, and they had emerged into the forest again. Hans patted the faithful pup on the head and looked around him. The woods had a different feel on this side of the tunnel. 
The trees were the same, but there was an intangible energy surrounding them. He couldn't put his finger on it, but he felt as if he had emerged in a new place. First and foremost, however, he needed to start a fire. He and his new sidekick were going to need a little light and warmth to get them through this cold night. After sharing the last of his provisions, he and the dog snuggled into the blanket together. The temperature was lower even than the night before, and the dead leaves gusted in the breeze, making little whirling spirals around them. But they kept each other comfortable and managed to sleep through the night. Upon waking the next morning, Hans knew that this day must be the last day of his journey, and that it would end with finding the handbell. As he set off, He smiled at the dog, which was striding importantly by his side. His new best friend needed a name. He pondered what it should be. Spot? No. Brownie? No. That was too obvious. As if reading his thoughts, the dog peered up at him, eyes twinkling. His funny, whiskered face reminded Hans of a man named Fritz, who frequented the pub at home. He grinned broadly. Fritzy. That was perfect. Fritzy it was. The dog ran ahead of him, as if glad that the matter had been decided. Unlike the previous mornings, this one was dark and moody. Hans pulled the blanket closer around him as he walked. Looking up at the sky, he thought there might be a storm coming. He quickened his pace, hoping that if he covered enough ground, he and Fritzy wouldn't end up soaked to the skin. Luckily, he would soon find that this was to be a shorter travel day. Before he was expecting to, he came to a place where a massive dead oak was sitting in the middle of the road. It was a gnarled and towering thing. Looking upward, Hans could see its weighty branches extending to the sky above the younger living trees below. He wondered to himself how old it was. Walking around the side, he found the hole the storyteller had told him about. It was a bit above his reach, a jagged opening that disappeared into the recesses of the trunk. He would have to climb part way up, and then reach his hand above his head and put it in the hole without seeing what was inside. Fritzy sat calmly nearby. 
Hans put down his knapsack and prepared to find a foothold. There was no time to waste if he wanted to reach the castle before the storm broke. One, two, three. He hoisted himself up high enough and fearlessly inserted his hand into the mysterious gap in the tree trunk. At first, he thought there was nothing there, but feeling around a bit, his palm made contact with a very cold, very smooth surface. Then, a wooden handle worn with use. Teetering on his perch, he grabbed the handle and slipped back down the trunk to the ground. Then he turned and brightly displayed a brass handbell to Fritzy. The dog barked in congratulations and wagged its stumpy tail with excitement. It was the final piece of the puzzle. Hans was filled with a sense of purpose. Pulling the blanket back over his shoulders, he told Fritzy to look lively. They had a castle to find. Just a few minutes on, the road parted. The main branch continued straight into the darkening forest. It twisted ahead, leading to places unknown. He spared himself just a moment of curiosity, thinking about those far-off places. But his destination was clearly at the end of the smaller trail to his left. Peering around the curve in the path, he could just spy a mouldering old stone wall. This had to be the castle, he reasoned. His discovery of the handbell must surely be an indication of that. As the two travelers approached the wall, they instinctively slowed their steps. It wasn't fear Hans was experiencing. Naturally, that emotion was unknown to him. It was more a sense of reverence. It was obvious to both man and little beast, that they were entering a very old place, and that the place itself was an important one. Following the path along the ivy-covered wall, they couldn't see inside at all. Hans assumed he would eventually reach an entry and he was right. After a short time, a massive wrought iron gate appeared. It looked for all the world like it hadn't been opened in years. Of course, Hans thought to himself, that was ridiculous. Even the storyteller had said that many visitors had been coming to the castle to win the princess. Mustering his dignity and trying not to feel silly, he began to loudly ring the handbell. It resonated starkly 
in the silence of the forest, its vibrating tones rippling through the natural sounds of the autumn woods. Fritzy sat nearby, his ears alive to this unusual music. He was poised for action. But nothing happened. Just as Hans was about to raise the bell and try again, for what else could he do? The voice of an old man came echoing from inside. Do not ring that bell again, the cranky person called. Give a fellow a minute, would you? Hans and Fritzy gaped at each other. Then their attention turned to the inside of the gate. A very small, grey-haired man in an old-fashioned manservant uniform appeared. Pulling with all his might, he forced the gate to open just enough so that Hans and Fritzy could squeeze through. Once the two travellers had entered, he stood with ill temper and put out his hand. Hans looked at him with confusion. Impatiently, he said, Well, give me the instrument then. If I never hear that handbell again, it'll be too soon. Hans hastily proffered the offending item, and the man took it. Then, without a word, the gentleman turned and lurched towards a castle that lay ahead, waving his hand that the visitors should follow. Hans tried not to openly gawk as they made their way through the beautiful castle grounds belying its ancient-looking wall. The interior was well cared for and very welcoming. Although the trees and the gardens were clearly ready for winter, it was obvious how many charming spots there were for quiet conversation, contemplation of a fountain, or a shady nap. This was a treasured place, and it was clear that someone in the castle made sure it stayed that way. The castle itself was no less charming. It was not overly large or ostentatious. However, there were multiple towers and sections that hinted at twisting corridors and mysterious round rooms. It was easy to see that a person could find a nook in which to sketch pictures or lose oneself in a book on a rainy afternoon. Hans thought to himself that this castle didn't seem at all haunted or forbidding. Trotting jauntily at his side, Fritzy appeared to share his opinion. When they reached the formidable front doors of the dwelling, the grouchy little man pulled the portal open by tugging with all his might. Hans had an impulse to help him, but he held back. He had a feeling that his assistance 
would be an insult to the older man, who didn't seem the type to want a boost while doing his job. Once the heavy doors were open wide enough, the man strode wordlessly inside, clearly expecting Hans and Fritzi to follow. Then, almost causing them to bump into him, he turned abruptly and began to speak at them in a voice that exuded boredom. I assume you're here to court the princess Maya. As I'm sure you've heard, no man has yet demonstrated the courage to stay three nights here at the castle. Each and every suitor has been sent packing. Here, the man paused and rolled his eyes. You don't get to meet the king or the princess until you've at least lasted one night. It is, and here he paused with a smirk, a waste of their time. Hans nodded in a way that he hoped looked humble. The servant continued by saying that Hans would be shown to his room and dinner would be brought up for him. If he was still here in the morning, he would be allowed to join the king and the princess for a luncheon. Having rattled off this well-rehearsed speech, he cocked an eyebrow at Hans and appeared to regard him with skepticism. Then, without saying another word, he turned again and began to climb a wide staircase to the second level of the castle. Hans and Fritzi hurried to keep up with him. His heels made echoing sounds as he led them down a long corridor filled with portraits. Finally, when they were almost at the end, he stopped and opened a door to a round room in a turret. Throwing it wide, he motioned to Hans to enter. The younger man stepped obligingly inside, and Fritzi was barely able to scoot in after him. Then, in a monotone voice, the man said, My name is Peter, and Hans had no time to respond before the door was firmly shut. The simple village lad looked around him. The tower was quite spacious. In the middle, there was a canopied bed with curtains that could be drawn around it. Hans knew that this was to protect against the draftiness of old stone buildings. Against one windowless portion of the wall, near the door, there was a large wooden wardrobe. The other half of the room boasted multiple windows, giving him a lovely view of the gardens. A writing desk stood under one of the windows. What a nice place to compose a letter, he thought. It was a simple chamber, but the nicest one he'd ever seen. It seemed the tired travelers had reached the castle in the nick of time. Even as Hans was setting down his knapsack, 
and gladly taking off his shoes, the cold rain overtook the world outside. Darkness descended upon the gardens. The trees leaned away from the wind, waving their branches against the deepening twilight. A hard pattering hit all the windows at once, and Hans was soon surrounded by the acoustics of the storm as it whipped against the castle. He lit a candle that was sitting on the desk, and then lay back on the large, soft bed, suddenly feeling very exhausted. Just as he was beginning to doze off, there was a knock on his door. Jumping up, he opened the chamber to find a tray lying on the floor outside. There was no indication of who had put it there, but he gladly took the plate of bread, cheese, and wine inside. Finding himself ravenously hungry, he shared some with the dog, and then ate every remaining crumb. Now, with a comfortable warmth in his belly, he felt drowsy and happy. He lay back on the bed once again, pulling the cover over himself. Fritzy jumped up on the mattress too, turning several times before curling up next to him. Without even realizing it, and with the torrential downpour intensifying around him, he fell into a deep sleep. Hans must have passed many hours in dreamless slumber, because when he suddenly awoke, the candle had burned down. The rain was still lashing the windows, and it was very dark in the room. At first, he couldn't think what had pulled him from his sleep. But then, he heard it. There was a noise in the hallway that sounded like chains being dragged across the floor. He sat upright in bed and held his breath, trying to figure out whether it was right near his room or down the hall. The sound stopped. Fritzy had heard it too. He was sitting in front of the door, his stubby tail thumping, and he was whining lightly. Rising from the bed and walking to the door, Hans threw it open, half expecting to find something right outside. But nothing was there. Sticking his head out, he looked up and down the hall. Torches blazed along the corridor, casting shadows on the stones. But it was silent. Hans closed his door puzzled, and began to stroll back to his bed. Just then, he heard it again. The noise sounded 
as if a chain was hitting the stone and then being dragged. Hans once again threw the door open to find nothing there. This is how Hans spent much of the rest of the night. Just when he thought the noise had gone away, it would begin again. But truth be told, he was not afraid. After all, what was this noise going to do to him? He was lodging in a luxurious castle room with a heavy door, and whoever, or whatever, made the noise was invisible. He had no plan to be scared off from his nice luncheon with the king tomorrow. Shrugging, He dozed on and off until the bright sun once again shone through the windows of his room. He opened his door with a plan of taking a morning stroll in the garden with Fritzi. Outside his room, on a fresh tray in the hallway, He found a nice plate with a pastry and a steaming cup of hot coffee. There was also a biscuit for Fritzy. Next to the plate of breakfast was a note in pretty lettering that invited him to luncheon with the king and Princess Maya. Hans grinned triumphantly and offered the biscuit to Fritzi with a flourish. He felt victorious. After a chilly romp through the garden, Hans left Fritzi in the turret room. Not knowing exactly where to go, He appeared in the foyer of the castle at the hour indicated on his invitation. Hans wasn't sure what was supposed to happen next, but as he suspected, the stone-faced Peter appeared exactly on the hour and indicated that Hans should follow him. He was led into a richly furnished sitting room, where he was left alone to enjoy the roaring fire and peruse the many books on a nearby shelf. He didn't have long to wait, however. The servant soon threw open the door, announcing in a formal voice that the king and the Princess Maya had arrived. Hans turned eagerly, although he was wondering to himself if the royal pair would be all he had hoped and expected. After all, he had never seen a king before. The man in question walked confidently through the door, wearing rich velvet robes and a guarded expression. He was a substantial man, if not tall, and he had a very noble-looking beard and moustache. But Hans was more interested in the young lady who followed behind. Wearing a simple grey gown, the Princess Maya nonetheless sparkled with humour and intelligence. 
Her dark brown hair was tied back and she wore no jewelry, but she did not need it. She was the prettiest girl that Hans had ever seen. Hans bowed to the king, who said, Well then, who's this lad who made it through a whole night in the haunted castle? Maya's face revealed nothing. She regarded Hans curiously and with reserve, but she didn't appear unfriendly. The lad responded by introducing himself. Then he added, Your Majesty, I believe you have a bit of a noise problem late at night in that hallway. I was unable to determine the source, however. Feeling bold, he flashed a smile at Maya and nodded his head in a small bow. Whatever Princess Maya thought of his comment, she didn't reveal it. The king raised his eyebrows as if skeptical. Then he and Maya sat down at a table which was laid with shining plates and silverware for three. Hans did the same. It was a very elegant meal. Rich hot soup and generous sandwiches were followed by delicate cookies and tea. As they ate, the king asked Hans a series of questions. Where was he from? What type of occupation did his family undertake? How did he hear about the opportunity to win his daughter's hand. These were very normal questions for any father to ask of a man seeking to court his daughter. Meanwhile, Maya merely appeared to listen with interest, although she always had the look of a person who was guarding her own thoughts. At the conclusion of the meal, the king stood, causing Maya and Hans to rise as well. He looked at Hans one more time and tilted his head to the side, as if pondering exactly what to say. After a long pause, he asked one more question. What are you afraid of? he said to the lad. Hans was taken aback, but almost without thinking, he responded. So far, I've been afraid of nothing. Then, seeing his answer might appear like boasting, he added, It does give my mother some concern. She wonders if I need to give more care. The king shook his head, as if he also thought Hans might be a little foolish. Then he told Maya he was going to withdraw, and Riley wished Hans a night of good fortune. If you are still here tomorrow, he added, which I do not think you will be, you shall come to dinner. Then he strode out of the room, leaving Maya and Hans alone. 
Maya looked at the closed door before turning back to her guest. Then she asked Hans if he'd like a tour of the gardens. He said he would very much, and the two of them ventured outside. He and the princess spent a lovely hour together after that. Clearly, Maya was a great lover of the castle grounds, and it was obvious to him that she had personally overseen the construction of all the clever pergolas and reading spots. The plants and trees were entering dormancy now, but she spoke with animation about what they would look like when they came back to life next year. As they strolled about, their conversation also turned to books, to likes and dislikes, and even to a few childhood stories. His time with Maya went by quickly. It was over too soon, and by the time she left him to his own devices, he was sure she was the most lovely and agreeable young woman he had ever met. He was quite smitten. When he returned to his room, there was a bowl of food outside that had been left for Fritzi. Hans thought this was an awfully kind gesture. For all his grouchiness, Peter, the manservant, seemed to like dogs. The daylight waned early, in keeping with the advancing autumn season. Hans found himself spending a cosy evening in his room, reading a book Maya had lent him at the end of lunch. Apparently, she knew there was nothing else for him to do in the turret room that evening. It struck him that she may have seen a suitor go through this process before him. But was he afraid of what lay ahead in the night? Quite simply, he was not. For Hans had still never known fear. dinner was delivered on a tray at the proper hour, once again with food for Fritzi. Nothing else remarkable occurred that evening. As nighttime descended, a howling gale struck again. Hans thought to himself, that if he didn't know better, he'd think the king was requesting this solemn weather just to deter him. He knew that was silly, however. It was merely the autumn in its stormiest mood. Once again, he dozed off in his big bed with an untroubled mind. It seemed like the wee hours of the morning when he was awakened to find the window wide open. The wind was howling into his room, whipping at the curtains around the bed. Jumping up, he pushed the window shut. 
he was surprised that this had happened. After all, the glass was very heavy, and it didn't seem likely that even this weather could push it inward. Shrugging to himself, he got back in bed and went right back to sleep. But he wasn't that way for long. In what seemed like a minute, he was again pulled from his dreams by what sounded like laughter. Sitting upright in bed, he looked around the room. The door to the hallway was wide open, revealing only darkness beyond. He quickly walked over and looked out. He saw nothing but flickering torches. Nobody was there. He closed the door again. But further dreams were out of reach. Alas, a banging noise once again interrupted his slumber, paired with another bout of howling wind. The window was open again, and this time so was the wardrobe. As he once more closed doors and windows, he swore he heard laughing again in the hallway. However, Hans was wise enough not to bother looking this time. He knew he wouldn't find anything. He ended up with a rather sleepless night. It seemed every time he was once again peacefully slumbering, a door or a window would bump open. The hall, the cupboard, the window. The hall, the cupboard, the window and there was always that faint laughing that almost seemed like a dream. Despite his lack of fear, he was rather disheveled in the morning. He found that he was glad he didn't have an engagement until dinner time, and he slept much of the day away in his turret room rising only to accept food deliveries and to take Fritzi out briefly into the gardens. When he returned from that quick foray, there was a snack outside for Fritzi. Next to it, he found another nicely lettered note inviting him to dine at 6 p.m. After donning the only clean shirt he had remaining, he left the dog napping in the turret room. Then he proceeded down to the foyer once again. This time, Peter took him to a room with a long dining table that had silver candelabras and a white cloth on it. Here, too, the hearth contained a cheerful fire. Hans found he was quite hungry, and he sat in a chair on one side of the table, waiting for the king and Maya to appear. Once again, he didn't have long to wait. The door to the room soon opened, and the princess entered, 
curtsying briefly to Hans, and then walking around to sit across from him at the table. The lad stood and bowed his head at the king, who took the third place, which was positioned between the younger people at the end. As Hans was taking in Maya's stunning emerald dress, her sparkling eyes, and her beautiful smile, the king gestured for the food to be brought in. Oh, and what a feast it was for Hans. Roasted meats, cheeses, fruit, and bread were placed on the table in abundance. Hans put on his best table manners and waited patiently until they were all served and the king started eating. Then, wordlessly, he tucked into his own plate. After a minute or two, the king finally spoke. So, he said, I gather that you managed to keep your courage for another night. He cocked an eyebrow at Hans, as if waiting for him to explain himself. Maya smiled a little bit. Hans could have sworn she was blushing. Yes, your majesty, he answered in a serious voice. The wind was quite something, wasn't it? I found my windows and doors would not stay shut. Do you often have such a gale here? The king peered at Hans from below bushy eyebrows and took another bite of food. Then he said, Why yes, it has happened before. Just ask any of the former disappointed suitors who departed in fear. This felt like a bit of a challenge to Hans but he wisely held his tongue. Then he said carefully, I look forward to facing whatever surprise may show itself tonight. The three of them all turned their attention to their meals, each one obviously thinking their own thoughts. At the end of dinner, a gorgeous tray of tarts and small cakes was brought in. The king, Maya, and Hans all sat around the table contentedly, feeling full and sipping on some tea. After a long silence, the king put his napkin on the table and said, Well, Hans, if you are still here in the morning, which I doubt you will be, we'll have an appointment to discuss the possibility of you courting Maya. In the end, the selection of any suitor is truly up to her. Showing your bravery here in the castle for three nights was just my first requirement as her father. Maya offered no commentary and did not appear surprised. She merely sipped her tea and stole a sly glance at Hans from under her eyelashes. Then, inviting no further conversation, the king stood 
bid them both a good night and exited the room. Maya too put her napkin on the table and took the last sip from her cup, indicating she was about to leave as well. Wanting to prolong the moment with her as much as possible, Hans asked the only question that popped into his head. He said, Princess, if it is up to you to choose, what are you looking for in a suitor? The young woman smiled and narrowed her eyes slightly, as if deciding whether or not to tell him. Then she said, Well, I suppose I'd like it if he were handsome. She paused as if to allow him a moment to absorb this. Then she continued, And he must like animals, and long strolls in the garden, and books, of course. Hans nodded, secretly wondering if he met all those requirements adequately. But most of all, she added with emphasis, any man who wishes to court me must understand that I will choose my future husband, and that simply passing my father's tests alone will not gain him the stronghold of my heart. At this pronouncement, Hans felt oddly clumsy and speechless. The declaration of autonomy was not something commonly expected of princesses. All at once, he realized two things. First, he had come unprepared for the glorious frankness of Princess Maya. Second, she was the most intriguing woman he had ever met. While Hans was processing this moment, Maya rose, wished him a successful night, and departed. When the lad returned to his room, he felt oddly unsettled. This was a new emotion for him, and it continued to distract him from his reading, and even from Fritz's snuggles. As the candle burned low, and the night approached, he wrestled with his thoughts. He was not fearing the third and final night of hauntings. No, that wasn't it at all. But he had this growing and unfamiliar sense of concern. Yes, He was concerned, and the longer he searched his soul for the source of the uncomfortable feeling, the more he found himself thinking of Maya. Her wit, her intelligence, her beauty. And the more he lost himself in thoughts about the princess, the more he realized that she had something to do with the source of his concern. Hans arrived here, assuming that all he had to do was be unafraid of ghosts for three nights, and he would win the heart of a princess. As a concept, 
it had seemed agreeable. But the reality of Princess Maya was so much more wonderful than he could have possibly anticipated. And now he was finding out that she might well reject him after everything he'd accomplished. This realization did not make Hans happy at all. Feeling out of sorts, he blew out his candle, pulled up the covers, and allowed himself to drift off into a fitful sleep. He was awakened by a low growl from Fritzy. The room around him was drenched in an inky darkness, since the overcast autumn skies outside had allowed for no moonlight at all. Trying to make out where Fritzy was in the room, Hans followed the dog's little voice and saw that he was crouched by the door. Just when Hans was about to call to the pup, the lad saw a light flash by in the crack at the bottom. It was moving very fast. Hans leapt out of bed and threw the door open. The torches of the wall were unlit for some reason. Nonetheless, even in the darkness, Hans was pretty sure nobody was there. He knew better than to tell the dog nobody was outside and expect that to settle him. Somebody, or something, was moving about the castle. However, as with previous nights, he shrugged his shoulders and got back into bed, hoping to get some sleep before morning. Alas, a bark from Fritzy pulled him from sleep just when he had drifted off. This time, the dog was standing on his hind legs, looking out of the window. Groaning, Hans drew aside the covers and walked across the cold stone floor to investigate the garden beyond. When he did, he saw why Fritzy was agitated. A glowing light was moving quickly through the night. It vanished downstairs at the door to the castle. This gave Hans the idea that whatever carried the light was probably inside once again. Whatever the case, Hans felt the only course of action was to get back in bed. This time, he may have slept for many minutes or hours He wasn't sure. He was dimly aware of the wind rattling the windows. Yet another stormy night, he thought with a groggy awareness of the noise. But just as this was blending into his dream, he felt the vibrations of a low growl at his side. The dog was alert to something, and it felt very close. 
Hans cracked open an eye and saw a light hovering right in the middle of his room. It was levitating in the darkness, or so it appeared. The gloom was so profound that Hans could really not see anything else. Jumping up with youthful agility, he lunged for the light and grabbed something soft instead. The glowing orb disappeared in the direction of his cupboard, and he was left holding the soft thing. After he lit his bedside candle with a shaky hand, the object was revealed to him. It was nothing but a dark blanket. But how had the light disappeared without the door to the hallway opening? Holding up the candle, he pulled the cupboard door ajar, pressing here and there. It only took him a moment to discover a latch inside the back. Lo and behold, a secret door swung open, revealing a very tight stone staircase that disappeared straight downward. Easing himself through, he carefully descended the steps to find another wooden door directly below the one in his own closet. Pushing the panel open, he stepped into another turret room and was amazed by what he saw. Peter and the king were both there and they appeared to be having a disagreement. The king was in his nightshirt, holding a candle. Meanwhile, the servant was in his usual uniform, and he was carrying an unlit torch. You let him catch you, the king was whispering at the servant. Don't blame me, the ill-tempered little man was retorting. How did I know he'd grab my disguise in the dark? Hans cleared his throat and held out the blanket as the disheveled pair regarded him with surprise. I believe this is yours, he offered wryly. And that was how Hans discovered that the castle wasn't really haunted. Excited about all the uproar, Fritzi began barking and jumping. With so much noise, it wasn't long before Maya appeared at the door of the chamber in her long, white nightdress. Walking into the room, she demanded to know what was creating such a commotion. Once she saw all three men, she covered her mouth in amusement and started laughing. Seeing her unsurprised reaction, Hans realized in that moment that she knew all the hauntings had been play-acting. It was obvious that she was perfectly happy to have sent so many suitors packing. This revelation gave him butterflies in his stomach. 
as Hans regarded her, with that unpleasant feeling of concern surging through him again. Her father turned to the lad in exasperation and said, Nothing worked to scare you away. What are you afraid of, man? Without missing a beat, and without even pondering the truth that was coming, he looked at Maya and answered her father's question. As it turns out, I'm terribly afraid that your daughter will send me away now, he said with a crack in his voice. At this, Maya's face became very serious, and then she gave him a comforting smile. But he was not sure if it was meant as a consolation prize, or if she was going to realize his hopes and tell him he could stay. After a few seconds that seemed like an eternity, she responded. Oh, don't worry, Hans. You can stay around for a while and try to impress me some more. Then, with a wink, she added, Besides, I like your dog. Everyone in the room laughed, even Peter. And because it was ridiculous to try to go back to bed, they all went to the morning room and had warm milk and cookies. Maya didn't agree to marry Hans the next day, or the one after that. But the two young friends did begin spending a lot of time together. Hans pitched in to help out with some tasks around the castle in his free time, which made him a welcome guest. There were no more hauntings, of course, and when the cold snows of winter passed and spring brought the world back to life, the one-time village boy finally heard the words he'd been waiting for. Seated in one of her charming little pergolas, with a graceful fountain pattering nearby, Maya agreed to marry Hans. They sent word through the forest to his family that they were invited to a wedding. Of course, they made sure that the dark little cave was well lit for their guest's journey and they built a much better bridge so that the incoming travelers would not be afraid to make the trip. And, at Peter's request, the front gates were thrown wide open for their visitor's arrival, and nobody rang the loathsome handbell ever again. And because of that, even Grouchy Peter lived happily ever after.